The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Jesus departed from there and came to his native place, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished. They said, where did this man get all this? What kind of wisdom has been given him? What mighty deeds are wrought by his hands? Is he not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his native place and among his own kin and in his own house. So he was not able to perform many, any mighty deeds there apart from curing a few sick people by laying his hands on them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. The Gospel of the Lord. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, I welcome you here. Last week, we completed the third part of the four-part series on the kerygma, that word that in Greek that means proclamation, that proclamation of the gospel message, proclaiming what God has done for us through his son, Jesus Christ. Last week, we spoke about how God has rescued the human race in Christ Jesus, which answered that question, what, if anything, has God done to fix the mess? Again, much of what I'm presenting is based upon Father John Ricardo's presentation on the Kerygma, but I'm adapting it to my own style. Today we have a reflection, we, we reflect upon how God has won victory for us, destroying the power of the devil and the power of sin and death, and that Jesus came to die for us, but he also came to fight for us which moves us into that fourth part of this presentation, our response. What then is the reasonable response for someone who saves to someone who saves you from death? What is the reasonable response to someone who saves you from hell? What is the reasonable response to someone who has bound the strong man so that you can go free? Isn't it reasonable to trust him? Isn't it reasonable to surrender to him? And isn't it reasonable to tell others, to help others to enter into that freedom? So it's responding in love. The four movements of the Kerygma include God the Father creating us and all creation out of the abundance of his love. God freely makes everything from nothing and says that it is good with man and woman at the, the crown of the divine plan. Original sin and every sin thereafter wounds and destroys that original perfection introducing suffering and death into the world. God comes to rescue us by sending us Jesus Christ, who by his life, ministry, death, and resurrection saves us from eternal separation from God and from death. And history abounds with stirring examples of individuals who were willing to give their lives to rescue another. A father drowns in an effort to save his son in the water. A soldier is killed as he helps a wounded comrade. A firefighter dies of smoke inhalation, saving children in a burning home. And over these last couple of weeks, I've used examples from World War II to illustrate some of the important concepts. So I'll use another one. We remember St. Maximilian Kolbe trading places with a stranger condemned to die in the concentration camp of Auschwitz. In 1939, the Nazi panzers overran Poland with deadly speed. Neo Polakonov was severely bombed and Kolbe and his friars were arrested, then released in less than three months on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. But in 1941, he was arrested again. While imprisoned in the terrible concentration camp of Auschwitz, he stood with the other prisoners as the commandant announced that 10 men would die because a prisoner had escaped. The commandant went around randomly choosing prisoners to die. They were being marched away to the starvation bunkers. 
number 16670, dare to step from the line, he said, I would like to take this man's place. He has a wife and children. Who are you? The commandant asked. A priest was the response. The commandant obliged and kicked Francis Gajovinecek out of line and ordered Father Colby to go in line with the other nine. When the 10 arrived at what was called the block of death, they were ordered to strip naked and put into a small bunker and their slow starvation began in darkness. But with Father Colby there, there was no screaming. Instead, the prisoners sang. By the eve of the assumption, four were left alive and the jailer came to finish Colby off as he sat in a corner praying. He was injected with, injected with carbolic acid. His body was burned with all the others. Thus he was martyred in 1941 on the eve of the Assumption of Our Lady. He was beatified in 1971 and canonized in 1982. And so we see in him a beautiful reflection of God's love. Love compels us to offer our lives for the sake of another, whether a loved one or even a stranger. Love compelled our Lord to fight for and give his life for others. If you had been Francis Gajovinecek, who watched Father Colby literally trade places with you, how would you feel about that person? How would you honor his memory and his sacrifice? How would you live differently because you were rescued from death? We have accounts in the scriptures of our Lord raising people from the dead, but what Jesus offers us is much more astonishing. Not a rescue from physical death in this life, but a rescue from eternal perdition the possibility of eternal life forever in the kingdom of God and perpetual union with the Lord. When we grasp the enormity of this grace, we feel compelled to respond with a dedicated life of faith and service and discipleship. If God loves me that much, I will give myself to him in a total and absolute way. This stunning realization that Jesus died for me and fought for me shatters all complacency, ingratitude, and indifference. It's why the saints could, could not contemplate the crucifix without weeping. Conversion is this radical and total uprooting of the heart. And God wants to invade our lives with a saving mercy and will not rest until we have let Jesus into our inner chamber and surrendered to this amazing grace. It's important for us important for each of you to understand that Jesus has reached into your life. He has reached into your heart. He sees that something has been broken, something has been enslaved, that victory has been accomplished for you. And if we're honest with ourselves, we recognize that there's something in us that has been claimed by the devil. There's something in us that wants to sin. There's something in us that wants to be a slave like the Israelites in the desert who said to Moses, we are disgusted with this wretched food. Let us go back to our flesh pots in Egypt. But Jesus has purchased our freedom. In our gospel today, our Lord has returned to his native place and performs miracles in the midst of the people. He teaches them divine wisdom and it says, because they knew his family, because they were familiar with him, they took offense at him. They don't recognize that they need to be saved. You see, we've all heard these Bible stories about the life of Jesus all of our lives, and perhaps we're too familiar with them. We've perhaps become desensitized to the impact of them. That's why we try to rediscover being amazed, overwhelmed by the gospel message, recognizing that God did all of that for you and for me, as if you were the only one in need of saving as if I was the only one in need of saving. So how do we respond? Well, our first response is gratitude and praise. The practice of our Catholic faith becomes our response in gratitude and praise for all that the Lord has done for us and will do. You see, we don't primarily go to mass and do what the church asks us to just because it makes us feel good or because we want something out of it. It's an act of worship. It's an act of gratitude and praise. 
A religion ceases to become some mere fulfillment of an obligation, but it becomes an embrace of the divine romance, God's invitation for us to be in relationship and union with Him. Sunday Mass, regular confession, daily prayer, study of the scriptures, the practice of mortification, service to the poor and needy, the embrace of virtue, all become part of our response to the overwhelming truth that in Jesus Christ we have become adopted children of the Father, purchased with this precious blood of the Son, and anointed in the power of the Holy Spirit. Through these practices, we slowly, over time, incrementally, make more and more room in our hearts to have the Lord completely invade our very being. And it's my hope and prayer that all of our parishioners would experience that overwhelming love of Christ in such a life-changing and definitive way that we become true disciples who are on fire to evangelize ourselves and are eager to share that good news with everyone we meet, that we are witnesses of that saving power of God. So part of our response is to surrender to the power of the Holy Spirit. He requires our surrendering to him to give him permission. It takes an honest assessment of where we are in our relationship with our Lord. We need to recognize how we've believed some of the lies of the devil. We need to recognize them and renounce them. Because at the very top of the list of these lies is that we're so broken that the Father won't want us back. But it's a lie. So we ask the Holy Spirit to reveal those lies that we might renounce them. Things like, where is the devil accusing me right now? What lies crippling me right now? Where is he causing division in my life right now? Where is the devil flattering my ego right now? Where is temptation strongest in my life right now? And where am I most discouraged right now? Because the devil masks himself to make us think that these thoughts are merely from ourselves, or worse, that they're from God. The devil doesn't want us to know that he's real, and these kinds of lies keep us in captivity. But God has come to rescue us from captivity. And the more we're healed, the more we recognize our dignity, and the more and more we can help others toward rescue and redemption, that we can be part of that rescue mission. So I'd just like to conclude with a prayer to help us to open up inwardly and outwardly. And if you feel um, comfortable doing so, I would just encourage you to repeat after me as I pray, pray this prayer. Father, I believe that out of your infinite love, you created me. I come before you just as I am, with all my brokenness, wounds, and hurts. I am sorry for all the times I have believed the enemy's lies, that you are not a good father and don't love me. I repent and ask you to forgive me for all my sins. Thank you for sending Jesus, the ambush predator, the one who came to fight for me, to rescue me from sin, death, hell, and Satan. And so today, here and now, I surrender to you, Jesus, and desire your Lordship over every area of my life. I ask you now to flood my soul with the gift of the Holy Spirit to, mo to know my true identity as your child. Help me to know that in your eyes I am worth the trouble 
I met her, and I am worth dying for. Holy Spirit, recreate me to be the person you destined me to be and to accomplish the plan that you have for my life. Please use me as an instrument in your hands to rescue others and to help recreate this world that you so love. Our Lady, Queen of Martyrs, pray for me. Amen. And it occurs to me, as we pray through that prayer, it's a kind of uh, altar call. But something that's very popular in the uh, Protestant church, but we Catholics have our altar call too, don't we? Every time we come forward for the Eucharist, we are renewing, renewing our covenant with the Lord. Every time we come, for, come forward to the Eucharist, is it not asking the Lord to transform us into his likeness as we take him into our souls, into our hearts? And so I encourage you, as you come forward for the Eucharist today, if you are properly disposed to do so, to make that an act, a renewal of your covenant with the Lord. <laughs> 